This episode of Stereophonic is sponsored by Universal Audio, pioneering audio recording for more than 60 years. Find out more at uaudio.com. Welcome to the digital airways of Stereophonic, an ongoing conversation series presenting the people personalities, and perspectives of the modern music business. I'm Dan Kimpel. With our fourth season, we continue to introduce you to those in the spotlight and behind the scenes, and all of our stereophonic subjects are right here with us in person. It is our objective to entertain and inform you as we reveal tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. Our music world was stunned with the recent passing of Grammy and Tech Award winning engineer and producer Ed Journey. With credits that included the Rolling Stones, Bonnie Raitt, Jackson Brown, Bob Dylan, and Eric Clapton, Ed was one of the greatest board masters of all time. These prodigious achievements were mirrored in his immense humor and loving heart. You know, you can make a record and it's perfectly balanced, you know, with the bass and the kick and all the instruments, but it doesn't make you feel anything. And there's a, there's a way to do it. I, I can't tell you what that way is, but I know there's a way and you just keep on going until, uh, you know, and, until your tail starts to wag or, you know, or, or tears form, you know, and then you, you know you have it. We thank Ed Journey for the light that he shared and the music that he illuminated with his genius. In his honor, we present this encore conversation. Storyophonic is on the road. We are at Village Recorders in West Los Angeles, and you're our guest on Storyophonic at oh, Journey. I'm happy to be here. Yes, and thanks we're happy for to thanks you. for asking me. Well, thanks for having us to your place. We are in Studio Ed, which at, is located at the Village. At the Village. Now you could obviously build your own studio wherever you want to, but instead, no, I, no, your I Village. Couldn't. You no, couldn't? I couldn't. No. <laughs> I'm in the music business. You know, um, you can't make any money, but you can get rich. I like that. Yeah. I like that. But there's obviously a sense of musical community. We're in a fairly small room here, but should you need to use a large room, there's certainly a number yeah, of Yeah, well, I just designed this room to be able to mix in, and then, you know, and just did that. And then figured out, you know, how to use these tinker toys to, uh, you know, to make a, you know, make a record sound great. It took a little while, but it can be done. Yes, to make a record sound great. Yeah. Yes. Most importantly, make a record feel great. Ah, feel as opposed to sound. Explain. Well, you know, you try to turn this cold, hard technology into emotion. You know, make people feel sad, make them feel happy, make them shake their ass, uh, make them feel hope, make them feel despair. Um, that's, I mean, really, that's what you have to do. You know, you can make a record and it's perfectly balanced, you know, with the bass and the kick and all the instruments, but it doesn't make you feel anything. And there's, there's a way to do it. I, I can't tell you what that way is, but I know there's a way and you just keep on going until, uh, you know, and, until your tail starts to wag or, you know, or, or tears form, you know, and then you, you know you have it. When I put together playlists of, of, your, of your work, um, you're invisible. We don't really, you don't have like a, there's not like a set, a set standard kind of a thing that we can identify you by. I mean, you, it seems like you create an environment that the music moves through you. Yeah. Well, oh, well the, thanks for noticing. I, th I think that's, I think that's what you're supposed to do. And, you know, you know, when you do this, especially, you know, you work as a engineer um, and a mixer, you know, hopefully you develop, I guess you would call it, sonic personality and uh, you know i'd like my sonic personality to be just that that i'm invisible and the music speaks the technology's gone the speakers don't exist all it is is just the music and the artist in the room with you and if i can do that i'm doing good and you know the idea is you serve the artist you serve the music that's you know that's that's really what your job is your responsibility is such an interesting palette of projects especially recently and i always like to be right in the present with the things that you've done most recently i think that's always a pretty good starting point i mean recently i've done um i've just started a second willie nelson record yes. that i worked on we did last year we did uh, he got the gershwin prize gershwin. for popular music yes. so we did a record with gershwin songs which was a absolute gas won him a grammy which was really nice 
um, and we just started one. He's doing uh, Sinatra, which, um, you know, and it's a beautiful record. We just tracked it and going to start overdubbing it um, after the holidays. The Gershwin record sounds amazing. Oh, great. Yeah, I really, it was a labor of love. I love doing it. I love Willie. Um, you know, I love everyone around him. His producer, Buddy Cannon, is, uh, you know, an icon. I love him. It's just, a, it's just a great scene. And be able to work on music like that and work with Willie is, you know, it makes it all worthwhile. So what is the scenario to, how does Willie work like with something like that? Um, well, basically we track it and uh, a guy named Matt Rawlings, who's the co-producer, who's also a great, great arranger. He's played with Lyle Lovett forever. And I think he started out with Keith Urban. Um, Matt plays with everyone and he's a wonderful arranger. So we come to Los Angeles and, uh, and track it and Willie kind of, you know, Buddy, um, Buddy Cannon and Matt, Buddy absolutely knows Willie's done dozens of records with him and, you know, and create arrangements and put a band together and, and track it that we know that Willie can sing on it. And then we go overdub Willie, you know, overdub him on it. Is it a fairly organic recording process when Willie himself comes in? To totally. Play? Yeah, totally, totally organic. Guys playing, um, yeah, guys playing. Yeah. 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 It's very cool to hear um, the Sinatra thing sounds amazing. I know Willie has a lot of reverence for Frank Sinatra. Yeah, well, who doesn't? Yeah, really. You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's great that you can sing along with all the songs, you know. We follow the bouncing ball, so everybody's <laughs> singing along when we're, you know, when we're cutting it. Do you sing along too? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I get paid to shut up sometimes. You know, people <laughs> yell, shut the fuck up, Ed. <laughs> but I can't help myself. I dance and I sing and I absolutely let the music take me away, which is, a, you know, a double-edged sword. But. I love it. I love it. Um, you worked on another project, which I found very interesting, which was um, uh, The Rides, which yeah. was a super group with Kenny Wayne Shepard, Stephen Stills. Yeah, we did that Barry last Goldberg. year. Very cross-generational kind of energy in there. Barry Goldberg's yeah. credit's gone way, way back to 60s. Like yeah, and, and you know, it's it's um, funny. It was a fun record to make, you know, certainly challenging. Uh, but, you know, I love Stephen. Kenny Wade Shepard is, is, is a bad motherfucker. You know, certainly Stephen Stills deserves all the reverence and respect you get him. But when I was growing up, uh, I grew up in Chicago and I loved the blues and Barry Goldberg from Chicago. And he was my hero when I was growing up. Him and Mike Bloomfield made a record called Two Jews Blues. That was, I think I wore that record out. I must have bought that record four or five times from wearing it out. It was really important to me. And I, and, and, uh, Mike Bloomfield was from, uh, right near where I grew up. And, you know, I think he was one of the, the greatest guitar players ever. And I was aware of him. And Barry, you know, was, was, I mean, literally my hero. And I had never met him. And it was great, you know, when I met him and we actually became friends. We had a lot in common. Um, now we play cards together and go to dinner and hang out. And, and I and I love Barry and his wife Gail. I'm so happy to be to you know to be friends with him. It's it's really really meaningful to me. And we have all these Chicago things in common. But you know what those guys did is, and there was Corky Siegel and Harvey Mandel and and these Jewish kids from from Chicago that revered the blues and went down to the South Side and befriended Willie Dixon and Howlin' Wolf and Buddy Guy and. And these guys took these kids under their wing and taught them the real blues, you know, and taught them how to play and the real attitude. And that, you know, th that was pretty, pretty damn cool. And I respected these kids. I respected the hell out of these kids that they were able to do that. And I respected the hell out of, um, of uh, Wolf and Willie and those guys that accepted these kids and were so kind and so giving to them. You know, yeah. There's that music bridge thing. You know, it just bridges generations and cultures. Yeah, and, and you yeah. know, music is a thing that you share. Players, players yeah. share. You know, you know. Every musician I know is is totally giving. You know, totally giving, willing to share, and not expect anything in return, but share for just the sake of of sharing. You know, and sharing their humanity. And that's, you know, that that's what kind of what makes this all worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. But do you, you, you had aspirations of being a musician in Chicago? Um, you know, I never thought I could make a living at it. But, mm -hmm. you know, we certainly, I grew up in a musical household. My mother was a singer. Uh, my parents had a, a, a community theater, you know, did musicals, um, took guitar lessons, uh, piano lessons, but I didn't have that. And my brother and sister did too. My sister's the most musical out of all of us, but my brother's a bass player. Um, I didn't have that practice gene. I really didn't, you know, to, um, 
and you know where our house was across the street from the schoolyard and I could where the piano was and I had piano lessons I had a very strict German teacher Mr. Stroll and he smoked cigars and boy he, he would spit all over me but I could look out the window of, of uh, where the piano was and see all my friends playing baseball out there so sometimes I had a really hard time sitting through lessons it's classical music and I loved it but I, you know, you have to practice it, and I just didn't. I just didn't have that gene. So, you know, I loved music and did musical theater and sang and played in bands, but never, never thought for a second that you know you could have a career as a musician. At what point did you become aware that you could have a, have a career on the other side of the glass? Well, you know what? I went to college and I had a, uh, you know, got a liberal arts degree. Sorry about that. It's okay. You can edit that out, can't you? Yeah. It was Al Schmidt calling. You need to. You're going to need to interview him. He's got. <laughs> he's go. got stories. There you go. But I was. Um, I got out of college, and I thought I was going to go to law school. And the summer out of college, I had some friends that I had been friends with for a long time that had played in bands with, and um, um, were friends with, and they were going out on a tour. And uh, and I put myself through school by driving a truck. I knew how to drive a truck. Hey Ed, you wanna? Okay, so I drove a truck. I drove their truck and rode it for him. I was young. I was a beast, boy. I could, I could lift a thousand pounds, and um, and I was always an AV guy. You know, I was always interested in that. I remember my dad brought home a wall and sack. Um, that was an old 3M tape recorder, probably made in Minnesota somewhere. <laughs> um, and I remember playing with that and creating radio shows and sound effects and echo loops and. So uh, one night the the uh, sound man didn't show up, and it was hey Ed you're gonna mix the band tonight. You know it was probably it was a six channel mixer. You know you could hear the band they were playing clubs, but I did and you know I paid attention. You know how the PA was set up and I took an interest in it and I mixed the band that night. It didn't do very very good job, but I kind of had a an affinity for balancing vocal harmonies and it was uh, you know very heavy vocal harmony band I had. Well, because you know, on road trips, you know, we sang five part harmonies, you know, wherever we went in the car with my mom and dad and brother and sister and you know, we were always we were always singing and playing and making music. Um and at the end of the summer they went into a recording studio. I'd never been in a recording studio and invited me down. And when I walked in the recording studio, you know, that lightning bolt hit me. It was like, Oh my goodness, this this is what I'm supposed to do. I just knew and forget about going to law school and uh, you know I eventually it took three years of, uh, of hard work but I finally got a job in Chicago as an apprentice engineer at a studio called Paragon Studios and that was the kind of place I remember I got hired I mean I made it my job once a month I would visit all the recording studios in Chicago knock on the door and uh, and get turned down you, listen it's always been impossible to get a job as a recording engineer to be successful as one and that hasn't changed <laughs> it's still the same but I was lucky enough to get a job as an apprentice, and the, and the owner of the studio, a guy named Marty Feldman, really ran it like like an apprentice. I mean, you learn from the bottom. Show up tomorrow, and at 5 a.m., you know, clean the bathrooms, clean the headphones, clean the studio, get breakfast, get you know, running. You had to learn how to to uh, coil wires, how to hold a microphone, how to you know, how to do everything, how to load a tape machine. So it was really from the bottom on up and you had to earn every bit if you couldn't get a food order right you weren't moving to the next you know to the next stop which was maybe assisting the assistant you know setting up sessions were you aware of the personalities involved then and the people the people chops necessary to do the gig mm, you know i was kind of young and stupid and it took took me a minute to figure that out but it's funny i i've always you know i have kind of an outgoing personality and i really you know, I'm. You know, I just, I just run that way, and I love being around people, and I love kibitzing with folks, and I, you know, I just like to hear people's stories. So I think I have that natural, you know, that kind of natural thing, and having that kind of personality that people are comfortable with you, you know, and sometimes you will get hired because of that more than for your technical skills. That's an interesting yeah. point. So it's it's funny. There was uh, the studio manager at the time. His name is Dick Blumenthal, and I became very close with him. And uh, later on, he wrote about his experiences, and I didn't do it, but he talked about all the people that came came through the studio and worked there, and he had to mention that he never worried about me when I got the job. He knew that I, I had the, the, the personality chops, that I was probably going to be all right. And I was, you know, and I, I've been fine. You know, I've had a career for, you know, 45 years, you know, through all kinds of different styles of music, so I've been able, you know, to sustain a career and continue to work pretty steadily. Yeah. 
But nobody starts at the top, and you certainly uh, start at the top. Nobody starts at the top. Mm-hmm. You think you can. You can get lucky. So, you know, people that want to be producers and recording engineers, musicians are a little bit different because a lot of musicians are born with the innate ability, but they certainly have to practice. But they're born with that gene to practice, but they can pick something up and figure it out musically. The great musicians can... It comes to them pretty easily. Now, through hard work and practice, they be, that's how, you know, you learn to read and, you know, you really can take it to the, you know, to the upteenth level to really become, you know, a virtuoso. Um, but to be, especially to be a recording engineer, and I'll include a, a producer in this, you can be born with certain talents and abilities to be able to concentrate the way your ears work, the way you perceive the world. Um, You know, a lot of time it's through your ears, more than your eyes and more your nose and the taste of your tongue. Now, you're born with that. But, man, to learn how to do it right, you have to make every mistake there is. There's no way you're starting at the top. You know, I remember I had the desire and I had an affinity for it. I knew I was comfortable in the studio and I was at home in the studio. And I remember the, oh, I was probably working at the studio for about, maybe six or eight months, and um, it was kind of a test. And there were like, I guess, three or four uh, what they called apprentice engineers there. And the owner gave us, here's a tape of a song, put it up and do a mix of it. And you got about an hour, a couple hours, and I sat up there and doing it. And I was excited about that. I thought it was my big chance, and I mixed this song, but it just sucked. You know, it it just sucked. I didn't, you know... And well, that seems like a kick drum. It seemed, you know, and uh, and everyone else, they suck too, you know, starting out. And that was kind of a lesson that you got to work really hard. You've got to do it. You've got to live in the room. You've got to put in your, not your 10,000 hours, but your 100,000 hours to, to start getting an idea of really how it works. And not just how the equipment works, but how music works, certainly, but how the human soul works, how people perceive things and what you have to do. And it, um, so, I mean, I'm 45 years in, and I'm better now than I ever was, probably because I've made every mistake that you can possibly make, trying things, and then figuring out what works and what doesn't. And I spent a long time, I was lucky, I had a mentor named Bruce Swedeen, who I got to sit behind through eight years, and he he kind of took me under his wing. So, and I got to be his assistant on some Michael Jackson records and Quincy Jones and Rufus and Chaka Khan, the brothers Johnson. And, um, and, you know, I learned a lot by listening through his ears and with Quincy Jones through listening through his arrangements and the way he related to musicians and artists. And so that's like getting a PhD, but it's very different when you're sitting there yourself and doing it. But, you know, in the act of, you know, a lot of kids don't get to do this now, but in the act of being an assistant engineer in a studio, there are literally hundreds of different engineers and producers that come by and you would assist them. So you could pick up a lot of good things, but also you can pick up a lot of things you shouldn't do. Mm. You know, ways you shouldn't act, ways, you know, you find out what doesn't work. But you've got to sit in the hot seat and you've got to go for it. You've got to be fearless. You've got to be willing to fail because you're going to fail. You're going to get fired. Um, you're going to have to pick yourself up and keep trying. And that's the only way, the only way you get good at it. Now, I've seen people that have gone in and first time out or first few times out, you know, made a hit. But they had trouble sustaining it because the truth is they didn't know what they were doing. Then again, you got a guy that did you see the, uh, the Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre documentary? You know, Jimmy really... Didn't know what he was doing in the studio, but, you know, finds himself all of a sudden he's engineering a Springsteen record. or And then he's producing Tom Petty, and here's a guy that somehow was able to pull it off and parlay that into, you know, into, you know, a billion-dollar baby, you know. So, you know, it can be done, but I'm not, I'm not one of those that can do it like that. And I think Jimmy's a special case. Our business is so interesting because there is really no roadmap, and certainly in your career, it's not like you could follow point A to point no, B. No, there, no, you can't. There's absolutely no career map. But coming uh, to California was clearly a thing that had to Coming happen. to California was yeah. the greatest thing, especially for being able to learn, and there were wonderful opportunities here. I worked, uh, I guess, for three years in his apprentice and worked my way up to an assistant engineer in Chicago and then kind of realized that was about as far as I was going to go, so got in the car with my girlfriend and uh, and we drove to California 
when we got to Los Angeles, I went. I got the Billboard directory in those days, the Billboard directory of recording studios. And I figured, what the hell? I went to the back of it. And the first place I went to was uh, Westlake Studios at 8447 Beverly. And I went and knocked on the door. And uh, and I got a job that day. I think my second day in, in Los Angeles as an assistant engineer there. But it's funny because I think I got the job because um, Maggie Welch, who was the studio manager, I thank her a lot. But she interviewed me. But we had a cup of coffee. And after I was done, I washed out my cup and uh, you know, dried it and put it back in the cabinet. I think that's why I got the gig. I think she told me later that's why she hired me, not because of, uh, you know, my resume or any other ability. And, you know, what, the next day, I think I was I was assisting Tommy Vicaria, who was doing a George Duke record. And I never heard anything sound like this. And musically and engineering-wise, it was it knocked my socks off. And I realized, man, I got a lot to learn. I got a long way to go. And I think the next week... Um, Swedeen and Quincy came in and they were uh, doing Michael Jackson's Off the Wall record and I ended up assisting them for, you know, for a number of years after that, you know, kind of exclusively working for them. Yeah, Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones, man. You know. what a, He's a wonderful man. He's a great man. And one of the things that I really learned from him is how you treat people. He treats people really well. And if you were lucky enough to get a, a, a nickname from him, you know, you were in. I was Big Julie. Um, everyone, everyone had a nickname, but it was my job to bring him a cassette. It was cassettes back then, uh, up to his house after the day sessions. And he lived up on Stone Canyon and I'd drive up there and knock on the door about 10 o'clock and I said, Big Julie, and he'd invite me in and we'd sit down and smoke a joint, have some wine, listen to music and talk about stuff. And then I was just some snot nosed kid, nobody that he treated me like a human being, you know, and treated me with warmth and kindness meant the world to me. And it really you know, really set me up to how, you know, to understand how you treat people, you know, and you treat people well, whether they have something for you or not. You know, it goes a long way. It makes the world a better place, makes your life better. And you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great way to conduct your life. As I look around in this room, the things on the wall can give me questions, you know, and very famously, you know, Bonnie Raitt, well, this is only a partial. The rest are stacked up somewhere. I think this um, is all, all the wall space we able to do. <laughs> the Bonnie Raitt uh, projects that you did, um, Nick of Time. And, yeah, Nick of Time, Luck of the Draw. Luck of the Draw. Uh, Lung in Their Hearts, and we did Road Tested. So I got to do four records, four or five records with her. Yeah, a lot of people second-guessed those records before they, when they were being made. I've they, read about yeah, that. Yeah. They did, but you know what? We were true to her, and uh, and it worked out. And no one... and. No one was going to tell her, you know, who she is or what she was going to do. She'd been around a long time. And Don was, who was the producer, had the good sense to hire me and to, you know, and we made it a point to support her and clear the way for her and, you know, make, you know, make her comfortable and, you know, make her feel like she could do anything. And she could. Yeah. yeah. You know, she really came through. Yeah, and she the A and R process of that choosing those incredible songs to do. And, yeah, that was that was you know, her, her yeah. and her manager and Don. You know, that mm -hmm. was they, they picked those songs. It was more her than anything. You know, and these great songs would show up. Although you know, Nick of Time, she wrote and it was just perfect, perfect for the time, and I think it's a perfect recording, a perfect performance. You know, um, I think the three main records we did with her were. There's, we're perfect in a lot of ways. When I think about the L.A. singer-songwriter sound, uh, which that, that's a part of that sound, there's so much air that we hear. You know, and almost, it's almost like lack of, you know, it, there's just the space, the spatial elements of those, of those records. How is that achieved? Great arrangements. Yeah. You know, having the good sense of not trying to fit, you know, 20 pounds of sausage into a 10-pound casing. And you find yourself trying, doing that a lot of times, you know, adding parts and things. But I think the way we approached it and she approached it and Don approached it was every, every note had to be meaningful. Everything had to count. And, you know, there were no throwaways in there. Everything was important for a place that, you know, that helped the song. And if it didn't, it was out. It was gone. So you could, you know, you have space for things to breathe for, you know. Yeah, yeah. How does one record the Rolling Stones? Very, very, very carefully. <laughs> it's, an, it's, an inter it's an interesting process. When I got hired to do them, we were, they were on tour, 
And uh, the first thing we did, um, everyone was making these unplugged records. So they wanted to do an unplugged record. And they had a couple weeks off in Japan. So Don and I, the, the night before were the Grammys and Don and I won Grammys. He won for best producer and I won for best engineer. And uh, after the Grammys, we got on a plane, flew all day and night to go to Japan, got off the plane to go in the studio. And I had, um, you know, fax. We had fax machines that faxed to set up to, uh, to the guys in the studio in Japan, and they did a great job setting it up. And, you know, everybody was live and in a circle in the studio and, you know, doing all these great songs acoustically. And that was, I mean, that was scary, you know. You know, I was expecting... I knew, it, I thought it was going to be temporary, you know, anytime someone's going to tap me on the shoulder and say, what the fuck are you doing here? Get out of here. But that turned out, that turned out great. And we ended up um, recording some pretty cool stuff. And to this day, I don't know if that, any of that has, has come out, but it was, it was stunning. The performances were stunning. The recording was particularly stunning. Um, and then they thought maybe they, they were going to get away, um, away with it, uh, at the end of the session, they were doing a, a live gig. They were touring Japan, but at the Tokyo Dome. And they were going to try coming out to the front of the stage, you know, sort of a B-stage thing and do it acoustically and maybe knock off a record that way. It didn't turn out that way. But it was, you know, I mean, it was really, you know, really exciting, you know, and nervous. It's the Rolling Stones. You don't want to fuck it up. And these guys have been around. They expect the best, and they deserve it. And, you, you know, you better show up. You better be on your A-game. Um, and I was able to do that for, I think I lasted about 13, 14 years. Um, you know, I think we ended up doing about eight, seven or eight records together, you know, between live and, uh, you know, and, uh, and studio records. Um, and the first one we ended up doing, which, which was live, we did at the Paradiso in Amsterdam, which was called Stripped, which was, you know, was really, really exciting, you know. Wow. Kind of returning them to their elemental thing. Yeah. Them more I mean, that's, that. that's the whole thing with yeah. them, you know, it's. You know, you create an environment that they're going to return to the thing that who they are. You don't get in the way of that. You know, you just, you know, you, if you can capture them, if you can capture who they are and their personalities, man, it's the Rolling Stones. It's going to work. You, What you do is you set up, you know, enhance it where you can, but you get out of the way. Yeah, cool. You worked with Bette Midler. Yeah. You know, oh, I love projects. Bette Midler. Is yeah. She, is she fun? Oh, totally. She's a total gas. She's smart. And sexy and talented and um, certainly challenging. You know, she knows who she is. You you better show up with her. Um, I got to do a bet, and then we did one some years later uh, called uh, for the girls. For the girls, yeah, yes. Doing those, it was a it was a gas, you know. And I became we became very good friends. You know, she's wacky, and I'm kind of wacky the same way. And we just you know, laugh, and uh, it's just pure, unadulterated fun. You know, she likes to torture people. Mark Shaman, who's her producer, has worked with her a lot, and and he's a very talented guy, you know, hairspray, and, and I love Mark, but she just knows how to get under his skin and, you know, and just torture him. Um, I didn't have that relationship with her. We were just became friends and just had a lot of laughs, and it was it's really fun. And and to this day, you know, we we text or talk, you know, once a month. She's the queen of New York right now. Uh, she's about to close in uh, in um, yeah, Hello Dolly, and uh, and she's great at it. I mean, she's a gas, and I, she's funny. I love her. You know, you follow her tweets. I love her. She's just tearing Trump a new asshole in the in the cleverest of ways. And she helps people. You know, she genuinely is is kind. You know, she can be a hard ass, but you know, building parks in New York, she quietly helps a lot of people, and she's very generous. And um, you know, she you know, you aspire to be the kind of person. There's a reason she's Bette Midler. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned Bruce as you were coming up. Are, are there other other engineers that you were aware of? That had an impact on Swedeen, I mean, Swedeen was was absolutely the king. Yeah. Uh, you listen to his work, and it's and it's just stunning. And he's able to pull the emotion out of it. You know, get it to swing. Tommy Vicari is another one I sat behind who, who was just a spectacular engineer, not afraid to to dig in. And you know, I mean, I learned a lot from him. Another guy I assisted for was Mick Kozowski. and Mick is just you know these guys are superstars, and. Um, and I think, you know, my style of engineering is kind of a bastardized version of them. I can't get close to how good they are. So I kind of borrowed from them and, uh, you know, came up with my own 
rudimentary way of doing it. But these guys were were great guys to sit behind. I mean, just just brilliant guys and just great guys to sit behind and very very generous with with information and sharing what they know. And and I think they saw that you were interested and you were for real and you went the extra yard for them. Um, you know, I never sloughed off as an engineer. I was, you know, I was a hundred percent there. You know, every moment that I could be. Um, and I mean, emotionally, intellectually, whatever knob they were turning, and being able to to look ten seconds into the future, to anticipate what they're going to do, to anticipate any problems that are coming up, and and they get that, and um, and they were just very kind and giving, and you know, and and I love them, and I you know I owe owe my any any skills I have, um, I absolutely you know owe them for it. How about the inverse? Are, are there any young cats now who you'd like to pick up some stuff from that are coming up? Uh, nah. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no. Well, you know what? You know, as I'm getting older, I kind of, if, if I'm working on a project, that's about the only thing that I'm concentrating on. So it's hard for me when I'm going home at night. I might listen to the comedy channel, but if I've had 15 hours of music, you know, I put everything I have into the project that I'm doing. So there's a lot of guys that are great. Chad Blake, you know, I never assisted for him, but God, Chad Blake, the records he makes and the sounds he gets, he's so creative and he's so intelligent and he's so soulful. You know, this guy is just kills it every time. Andrew Sheps is, an, is another guy. I never worked with him or friends. He recently moved to England, but I mean, the work he does is just spectacular. I love what he does. But then now there's these kid making these pop records, you know, the Max Martin guys that, um, you know, I come from a place where you were in a studio, you know, you used microphones and and musicians. Now I've done that, but, you know, create live loops, you know, just, you know, really push the technology is, is to, you know, to whatever it takes to make the music right, you know, to make it interesting. But there's these kids that are manipulating, you know, mani manipulating software and computers that they're brilliant. You know, the sounds that they get and the feels that they get, you know, they're absolutely brilliant. And that's, you know, probably where the future is going. And guys like me are, you know, are going to, you know, we're going to fall away probably as time goes on. Well, it's interesting, especially here in Los Angeles, where so many of the projects are done in project studios or in people's bedrooms or... Right. And it's a team yeah. of people doing yes. it. And, you know, they you barely need a mixer anymore. You know, these guys come in, they, you know, there's some guys that can do great rhythm and, and loops. And then there's the top line guy and, you know, who can sing and stack his vocals. And then, you know, they're in the computer. And when they get done, that record is, is about done. You know, here, here's the computer. Hand, I, get the music out of here, however you do that. Uh, and, and, and here's the record and it was a team of people that did it. So, you know, there's that, you know, and they're kind of self-contained and they don't necessarily have to send it to a mixer anymore. They'll send it to somebody like Serban, you know, who, or, you know, or Manny who's, you know, they're, those guys are doing probably, you know, 80% of the pop records being done today. How do the pop records sound to your ear? Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. You know, some... You know, I kind of hate it, but that, you know, that's the business. It's always been that, you know, the copycat thing. Everybody's using the same kick, the same snare, the same loop, the same rhythm thing, stacking the vocals the same way, the same kind of structure. But some, some is brilliant. Some is done really well. Pink, for example, I think I love the records that she makes that are pop, you know, pop. I got to tell you something. I, you know, I, even going back, it's kind of old now, like, uh, but a Britney Spears, a whoops, I did it again. It's a perfect record, perfect record. Um, so, you know, like anything else, there's good and bad, but there's some really brilliant, you know, some crap being done, but there's some really brilliant, you know, stuff with great performances and great arrangements and, and really, you know, really clever programming that are being done that, you know, you know, there's a reason that, you know, millions of people love some of it. Yeah. It's popular. They call it pop. That's exactly, that's <laughs> exactly right. That's what we try to do. Good. Good. Ed Turner, your name appears in the presets menu of some Universal Audio plugins. Uh, what was it like to collaborate with Universal Audio? I love Universal Audio. Bill Putnam was a hero. He started Universal Studios in Chicago. He was an icon. And when he came out here and created that 6000 Sunset, which was United, and then there was United Western at, at 6050 Sunset, um, you know, and he invented the gear that he used, 1176s, LA-2As. Um, you know, this guy was, could do anything. He was brilliant. So I became friendly with his son, Bill Jr. And when he started the company, 
um, we met somewhere and we hung out and uh, hopefully I encouraged him and started using their, their stuff right away. And it's gotten better as we go along. It's, it's, you know, I've, I owned a lot of that stuff and I've been selling all my hardware because <laughs> it's just been taking up space because they do such a great job with the software. So, you know, I used that stuff and then I got, you know, by sitting behind guys like Quincy and the other earlier engineers in Chicago that used that stuff, you could see what it could do and really know how to manipulate it, you know. I can't get a snare drum sound without an 1176, and I know all the settings or get a room pushing all the buttons and manipulate it that way. Um, so I know a lot of the settings. So, you know, it was being part of that family um, feels like home to me. So, I'm, you know, I'm happy to help them any way I can. You know, I'm delighted that they would ask me to, you know, to do a preset. If you're starting out, presets are okay, but you got to be a schmuck to use a preset. It's kind of easy. <laughs> it's not going to get you what you want. You know, it's different every time. You know, have a look at it, but come up with your own sounds. It's your responsibility, you know, to, to create your own sonic signature. So figure out your way to do things, which is fine. But, but you know, Chris Lord Elgy, you know, has his wave stuff that some a lot of people really like. Um, Jack Joseph Puig has, uh, has some, some. Michael Brower, you know, they all have some very interesting presets. And if you want to just go start and use one, like, you know, there's some I did for a guitar, for a room, or you know, to thwack a snare drum. I'm, I'm happy to, to get it, but, you know, be aware that that's not the, the get-all. That's not, you know, that's, that's not the final say on it. You need to manipulate it and find it and make it work in the context of the music that you're making. Are there any other plugins in your digital toolbox that, uh, that help give you that analog thing? You know what? I like yeah. the SSL uh, plugin that Waves has. I, love, I, I like that a lot. Between that and, uh, and Universal, uh, the plate, the 140 plate is, is off the hook, right? They make a 250, which is that the R2D2 reverb, which has a really great short, bright thing that sounds great on drums. The 1176 is Fairchild's. The 660s and the 670s sound great. I used the heck out of those. I never thought I'd be wealthy enough to have an infinite number of Fairchild 660s that I could use. And that's what they used in all the Beatles records. A big part of the sounds uh, that Jeff Emmerich did on the Beatles records is using those particular compressors. And they work really well. It's so interesting that they, they have not really improved many times on what came before. Yeah. You know? Like well, it's, two, it's set, it months. set the bar. You yeah. know, it, it absolutely set the bar. Um, I read a quote, I, I think it was talking about listening with your heart instead of listening with your ears. Um, yeah, that was, well, that was Bruce Wadeen kind of mm -hmm. taught me that. And I remember, you know, starting out and listening and trying to make sense of things and, you know, listening, listening wrong, you know, listening to individual things instead of, you know what, I, it's, it's funny because uh, I, did a, I did a couple of Bob Dylan records and I remember the first mix uh, was uh, Under the Red Sky and the first song, the first mix, he came in and, you know, I was still pretty young and pretty green, nervous certainly and un unsure, but on the outside, you know, totally confident totally large and in charge. It's only Bob Dylan. But the first mix, he came in and he listened. He looked at me. He says, this is fucked up. I said, what do you mean? He says, I can hear everything. And my first reaction was, well, God forbid. <laughs> but he was right. And I kind of got it that he wanted to taste the soup, not the ingredients in the soup. So there's something about that. And Swadeen, you know, would, would have turned to me and he was always very sharing, very, very giving. But he said, boy... Listen through the speakers, not to the speakers. Listen with your heart and not your ears. And that was really great advice. At first, I didn't quite understand what he meant, but now I really do. Now I really understand what he meant. And if you can do that, you're going to work. You're going to make music that moves people. I also read that you were encouraged to attend classical music concerts to hear the the sound that was early on you yeah. know i met swadeen in chicago and uh, took a class from him he had some kind of class and one of the first thing was you have to go out and you listen to classical music and he took me to the chicago symphony and he originally came to chicago from from minneapolis to record the chicago symphony and he said it was really important to hear music in the space it's meant to be he had an idea of timbre of instruments of what great reverb sounds like what a great blend sounds like what a great sounding space sounds like it was, you know, it's a great lesson and it gets imprinted in your DNA about what what that is. And you can transfer that to a lot of other applications. It doesn't have to be that, but it's the idea of, of creating 
sounds in a space that's that's cohesive and has a a beautiful you know a beautiful air and space around things. So it was. I mean, it was great advice. You've been very involved with Naris, and I guess calling attention more to the accomplishments of people from the engineers and producer side. Yeah. Well, I, I founded something. We we first started. It was called the Music Producers Guild, and then got. Uh, in a, oh, it took about five years and then got the Grammys to take it over because it was turning into a full-time job. And the way that started was uh, I was nominated for a Grammy. I went to a, a Grammy nominee party and I met a couple guys, English producers and engineers. A guy named Peter Filial and um, he did Charday, great engineer, great producer. Anyway, they were giving me a hard time. They had a, There was a, a, you know, a producers group in, uh, in England and Europe. Uh, they had a producer's guild, and they all got together and did projects and talked to each other and had meetings and were able to um, talk about gear and techniques. And actually, they were able to get together and collect money somehow for each other. It works a little differently there because they have a, a terrestrial rate of performance royalty that's collected there that we don't get here. And it kind of, it's wrong that we don't, you know, aside from Iran and North Korea, we're the only other country where a performance royalty isn't paid for radio play. And what that means is if you wrote the song, it gets played on the radio, you get paid. But if you sang the song or you played on it, you get nothing. It's unconscionable. And that money is collected all over the world. But because we don't, there's no reciprocity. So all the artists don't get paid anything. You know, you got Sam and Dave, you know. Sam is out having to, you know, at 80 some years out to support himself. You know, that, that stuff is staple on radio. That they, you know, so many great artists get nothing for it because they didn't write it. It's absolutely wrong. So we started that kind of to call, help call attention to that. And that's been, I guess it's been 20 years, over 20 years that, that, that we did it. But I thought it was important. You know, the, and the Recording Academy, Recording Arts and Sciences. And I felt that, um, you know, perhaps producers and engineers didn't get enough credit for what they did. But also, it was really, there was never a forum that we could get together in a room together. You know, this is something that we do apart. There's, you know, one engineer in the room. There's one producer in the room. A little different now, you know, more producers and engineers. But I thought if I could just create a forum where we could just get together and talk about things, you know, it could be anything could happen. Today. Who knows what would come out of that? So... It grew. We started out with me, and I called Al Schmidt and Elliot Shiner and George Massenberg and my friend Chuck Ainley and then Frank Filippetti, Phil Ramone, and, uh, you know, it just it just built like that. And uh, I hired Chris Stone. Chris Stone was a friend who owned the record plant, and he was a very good administrator. So I got them. I just paid him myself. I got the money up for him to be the executive director. And we just built it. And um, we got together and we included manufacturers and we started for the first time as a group had dialogue with manufacturers, how to design gear better, how to, you know, you know make things better, how to talk about our workflow. Uh, we created standards, delivery standards. Um, actually, we just did a, an updated paper with the producers and engineers wing um, that's, I think, the know-all and tell-all of, of delivery standards and how to do that. The labels are using it. Um, we're promoting high-resolution audio. Um, people don't know about it. They've been listening through $8 earbuds to compress music. And if they could hear it like we hear it in the studio, music has more value. It's it's more emotional. It's better. And if people could hear it like that, I think it will enhance their, you know, their 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 music appreciation and the experience of, of listening to music. So we just created a paper on that. Credits are another thing. We've been involved in metadata. Um, and metadata, you know, put you to sleep, but that's how everyone is going to get paid. Um, and there's, for the first time, there's something called RIN, which is um, software that's included all your uh, workstations and your Pro Tools and your Logic. And um, you can put in all your credits there, and it follows the project all the way along. Uh, for the first time, you know, we're going into a streaming form title in particular, but the other streaming services are coming on that they can read that metadata and on your mobile device when you're listening to, all the credits and artwork come up right on your iPhone. First time, you know, credits are very important. How many times guys like me get a call like, hey, Ed, it's, this is uh, Ry Cooter. I was just listening to a David Lindley record uh, that you made. And, you know, and they're looking at the cover and there's your name on it. They find you got work that way. And since the year 2000, probably, credits have disappeared. That's an intractable problem that has a solution now. So that's really important. And we're just a forum where, 
you know, we can deal with a lot of things and, and create a space that we can talk to and communicate with each other. It makes the music better. Our story of funny questions for you. Number one, Ed Journey, had you not chosen the music path, what would be your alternate career? I'd be living in a box under the bridge by the river, probably. I don't know. You know, it, it saved me. It absolutely saved me. I don't know where where I would have fit in the world. I don't. I don't think I got, could have gotten through law school. You know, it's it's curious that um, many of us, if not most, that do this by starting the Music Producers Guild. You know, the P and E wing. You know, you got a lot of friends that are engineers and producers. It's a it's a kindred group. You know. Kindred souls, we have a lot in common. Um, we're alike in a lot of ways. And one of the things that I've noticed it is that a lot of uh, guys that are engineers in particular um, had a bit of ADD growing up. They tested really well for intelligence, but couldn't sit through class, couldn't do well in school. And music and the thing and sitting in front of a set of speakers and having that technology there, I think is the cure for that. That you all of a sudden you can concentrate on something for 20 hours if you have to. And a lot, of, a lot of kids that I see have that thing, and they're lucky enough to find this. I was lucky enough to find a job that they invented just for an idiot like me. I was, I was born to do this. And I've been doing it a long time, and the, you know what? I love it more now than, than even when you could make you know, lots of money. And there's not a lot of money in it now. You know, um, budgets are a fraction of what they were because sales were a fraction of what they were. But that being said... What a great way to come to work. I open the door to my studio and I fire up my gear and I put up a song and, um, you know, I get to try to make it great. Make a, you know, make an artist great, make his work speak to people. Um, doesn't hurt the environment for the most part. And, uh, you know, it leaves a lasting legacy and you're helping people. And, and it gets you out of yourself. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful world. And at this point, you know, I've been doing it long enough that I'm working for people I have long relationships with, and I'm working on music that I love. You don't have to work for assholes when you're working cheap, you know. And for the most part, people aren't. You know, people are kind and giving, and, uh, and it's just it's, it's a great life. It's, a, it's just, a, you know, a, gr a great way to, to express yourself. Are there any dream projects or people that you would like to work with whom you have not yet had the opportunity to work with? No, I can't. No, I can't. You know, people ask that. I, I can't say. You know, the thing is, if I'm listening to the radio or I hear something that's really good, you know, I think, wow, I wish I did that. But, boy, somebody already did it and did a pretty great job. So I, the business plan I have now isn't too complicated. I wait for the phone to ring. And, and so far it rings when it needs to. And when it stops ringing, I'll, you know, I'll pack up and go play golf and go sailing somewhere. But in the meantime, I'm, I'm still here. At the moment, I'm working on a Willie Nelson record doing Sinatra. Um, I killed it. The tracks are just spectacular. I'm just starting to mix a Billy Vera record. Uh, I got a call last night from a woman who's been working for 10 years on a project with Van Dyke Parks. And... Um, and I had mixed a project with Van Dyke Parks and Brian Wilson called Orange, Orange Great Art years ago. And this is kind of that kind of record with lots and lots of tracks and, and dense harmonies and, you know, and really interesting arrangements. So, you know, the, the phone rings and it's, and it's fun. And nobody's waiting for anyone's record. I can go home and take my dog to the beach when I want to or, or go play golf. It's, there's not the, the pressure of when you were, you know, working for a record label. I, I don't get hired by record labels anymore. I get hired, get a call from the artist. So I've got one person to please, the artist. And it's so pure like that. And it's, it's for the most part, it's pleasurable. You know, when you're working for a label, you got a lot of people to answer to. And there's a lot more pressure and there's deadlines. And now, well, maybe the deadlines aren't so tight. And my only responsibility is to the artist and to make it great. And I've got my own room. I'm not eating up two or three or $4,000 a day in a studio. I can take as long as I want or and just until I think it's great. And everybody's cool with that. Well, Ed Cherney, we noticed we have to do, actually do an edit on this because the phone rang while we were in this conversation. Yeah. That's probably your next gig, brother. Yeah. You know what? You know, I'll tell you what, though. There's, uh, I've got a good friend who blew, who was in, in Tom Petty's band, and we're just, you know, devastated that Tom passed away. You know, somebody we really admired and someone, you know, that set the bar high and did it his way, didn't take any crap from anybody, or just, you know, had his own vision of things and was true to that for his entire life and his entire career. But uh, Scott Thurston, who was in the band, and you're talking, he says, yeah, the best part of a gig 
is the phone call. <laughs> you know, that's great. But then when you hang up the phone, you go, oh, now, you know, now I got to go to work. Uh, shit. But it's the anticipation of the work that's bad. But the, the work itself is once you're in there and doing it working is is so pure and it's really, you know, it's it's just great. Especially when you get to disappear and the collaboration is really the best part. A lot of people get robbed from that. You know, there isn't as much collaboration now as there was. But when you're tracking and you've got a room full of people that are great and everyone moving in the same direction, man, life is, you know, life is beautiful when you're part of a team and the whole is greater than the individual parts. And when you kind of disappear into the music, that's, you know, that's that's the best part of it. At Journey, may your phone continue to ring, and may you help all of us disappear into the music. And thank you for being our guest on Stereophonic. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Stereophonic, a regular podcast series with tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. We come to you from Datalite Studios in Los Angeles, California. Our show is produced and edited by Lindsay Tomasic. Our production manager is Kim Strand, and our theme music is by Dusty Gray. Please rate us on your favorite podcast platform, catch up with our past episodes, and visit us often for new shows. I'm your host, Dan Kimpel. <laughs>